asking some questions out there. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, hi. What do you do? You can hear me? Is it me or is it Sorry, I dropped, I dropped my phone. Um, thank you for the presentations. My name's Andrew Lamb. I'm from uh, Field Ready, and we manufacture a lot of medical devices in Syria, in Jordan, different places around the world. Um, I'm curious about the um, costs of the prosthetic device. I've never seen a project done so well, so con congratulations with that. You talked about the material cost, 20 to $50. I'm really interested in finding out, um, you know, everything we make in, in, as a humanitarian organization in disaster zones has got to be cheaper, better, faster than the traditional supply chain model. I'm interested if you've done that analysis um, to traditional supply chains, please. If we can take a few more questions and... Hi, my name is Anne from the Displacement Unit MSF. I also have a question for Pierre and Safa. Uh, first of all, how many, how quick would you have to replace the prosthesis, for example, in the in the case of the kids that you were showing? And also uh, related to this question, uh, what is the goal ultimately in, uh, let's say, when we have this technique implemented in normal running projects? How many patients would we be able to help on a yearly or monthly basis? Um, so a, a, a couple from the online audiences, uh, to Fabian, uh, do you have plans to pilot on other specialities? Um, and if so, which? And one for uh, physio. Um, you mentioned 13 cases that you provided prostheses for. How do you decide which patients to treat? Uh, if we can stop for a second. So, uh, Pierre and Safa, if you want to answer the three questions you have for the cost and uh, ultimate goals and, co and who, how do you set on the patients? And then Fabian, you can uh, talk about the specialties, other specialties for telemedicine. Sure. Yeah, I'll start with the, the price. So, uh, how do you set which patient you choose? And what's the ultimate goal? of the project, yeah. and then the cost for the process. Okay, so start. So the, re, regarding the, the patient criteria and um, for this online uh, question, so we had this certain patient is not, um, we, we said that we had certain patient that uh, get, uh, 11 patient that get prosthesis. Uh, we had 17 patient including in the project. Uh, meaning that um, some of them abandoned, so six of them abandoned, uh, three of them with the prosthesis, and three of them without prosthesis. Most of the time, because they had to go back to their own country, because we are located in Jordan, and we had patients from uh, Yemen, uh, Syria, or Iraq. And then the second thing is that um, our criteria is pretty, uh, pretty simple. We just take patient below elbow amputation. So all the patients with other kind of amputation, we didn't take them. So if, we, if it appears to be a, a small uh, sample, uh, it's also because the, it's, some, it's a new thing that we are providing, uh, I mean, that we are trying to provide. And uh, so it has to get to, uh, to be known also. So that was the first. Uh, then was a question about the replacement of the prosthesis uh, there. Um, so there is two, two things. The first thing is like, at the very beginning, we had some failure on the prosthesis, as Safa mentioned. I think uh, if you want to jump on that. But uh, the, on, the other thing is with the, the use of the prosthesis, especially with the kids, uh, when they outgrow the prosthesis, so we need to change the, the socket or we need to change the whole prosthesis device. But uh, the good thing is that we can just rescan and, and redo it and reprint the socket easily. So uh, in terms of, of time, it can, it can go from three months to one or two years, depending on the kids. But uh, now on, uh, on the certain prosthesis, we had to replace four of them. Regarding the pediatric population, uh, this could be a population that benefits the most. As the children uh, continue to grow, uh, we have a digital um, design uh, that we've created for, for the patient, and we can quickly uh, uh, rescan and redesign. So the hope is that uh, we can cut down on the time needed from uh, the prosthetic clinician or a trained prosthetic uh, professional. 
Um, we absolutely need them involved in the project. We in no way plan to remove the, the clinical professionals. As you, as you saw in the presentation, we have a multifaceted uh, uh, team of uh, clinical professionals, and each one of them has a critical role in the project. So um, what we do hope is that uh, as this project um, has scales, that it can reduce the amount of time needed from, uh, say, a prosthetic clinician, as we are fully aware that there is a, a limited number of prosthetic clinicians available in the world. Uh, so that's uh, one uh, opportunity for the project. Uh, there was a question regarding the analysis uh, uh, related to traditional supply chain from a uh, gentleman from Field Ready. Uh, so it's quite different uh, between different contexts. And what we have, we were basically settled in Jordan for a year, so we asked uh, the, the local uh, clinics uh, for information on cost and availability. Uh, what we were seeing with uh, the prosthetic clinic that we were collaborating with in Jordan was that they actually had access to um, uh, conventional uh, prosthetics, and they were actually pretty efficient at making the conventional sockets as well. Um, so in that context, um, they had the supply as far as materials go, uh, but the cost was very high. We're talking minimum $1,000. Uh, we've heard estimates as high as $3,000 for a passive prosthetic device that we can provide material-wise at about $20 to $50. And Pierre, what was the cost including the H, uh, the human resources? Yeah, so we made just an early, uh, um, early analysis of the price, including the assessment period, the test period, the different materials, uh, everything except the rehabilitation. And the early analysis is around uh, $200 to $250. Yeah, I just want to add something because uh, I skipped the, the second part of the question. Yeah, if we can give the chance to Fabian, and we have a few more questions. I'm sorry to cut you. Fabian, do you want to answer the question on the <laughs> daily medicine? Other um, specialties? Uh, regarding we have five more minutes. So. Okay, regarding the application to other specialties, so yes, they are uh, hoping to replicate the model, whether we use the uh, same technology or or a tool that offer uh, non-real-time and, and real-time uh, support. Uh, I think the area of specialty that I already identified are pediatric care, mental health, uh, and uh, management of burn cases, for example. Uh, should mention also that the store and forward telemedicine platform already address many of the specialties in the asynchronous model, but with a very short uh, uh, response time. Um, you have a question up there, please. Yeah. I'm uh, Daryl Stelmack from MSF UK. Um, a question for Hassan and Tobias, probably, and perhaps also Fabien. Um, the conflict in Syria is characterized on the one hand by uh, deliberate attacks on health care, and on the other hand by electronic warfare, where data communications or internet communications are you know, deliberately attacked and subverted. So. Without going into any operational detail, what are you doing to protect uh, this highly sensitive data in transmission from being intercepted or subverted? Because, of course, it can be traced back to individuals or, or geographic locations. Yeah. Yeah. I have one more question, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, hello. So my name is Hassan Zahid. I'm a medical doctor working for MSA. Uh, my question is for the 3D printing duo. So there's a very vibrant online community of open source 3D printing uh, designs. I'm pretty sure you would have come across them, which focus more on functionality based on tension band wiring. Uh, but you guys chose to go down the aesthetic route. So my question is basically, was it driven by what the patients wanted? What, I mean, did they want aesthetics over functionality? Or was there some other reason? So, uh, yes, uh, data, pr data protection is a headache. And uh, we are trying our best, especially today with the, with the, with the GDPR uh, starting. So uh, we, are, we started, uh, we tried in, in our, our projects, uh, whether we are collecting data from communities, whether uh, collecting data from facilities, to make it as much as anonymous as possible and to use uh, tools that make uh, uh, tracking this data or, or let's say, let's, let's put it like this. We are using basically tablets to collect the data. So if you, if you today manage to get one of our tablets, 
it, it will have multiple protection layers on the tablet itself. Uh, th there is the pin code to unlock it. There is the login, username, password to get into the platform. And then all the completed forms, you cannot open them again. Uh, data is protected from the first point this way. Then data transmission is through uh, internet, through encrypted, uh, it gets two layers of encryption before reaching a, a, a cloud-based server where there is another layer of encryption. I'm not saying that this is definitely 100% safe because if someone wants to, to hack you, they manage to hack the Pentagon. So we are just MSF, but we are trying to collect the, yeah. We are trying to collect data that, uh, by the end, it's still aggregate data, no unique patient's identifiers, no unique household identifiers, so that even if you get the figures, our, our figures, you will know the situation, but you will not know who is having what and where. Uh, I just want to add on, before we go, I want to just add on your question on the safety of the healthcare workers in the context of Syria. I can tell you for a fact that Nobody has any doubt in their mind that their cell phone or their computer is hacked and accessed. As a matter of fact, in many contexts, like in Ghouta recently and other places, the physicians and nurses were getting text messages to their own, their personal cell phones, threatening them of being, you know, loud or, vo or, or you know, verbal, very vocal about what's going on in their town. So nobody has any doubt in their mind that their, this data has been hacked somewhere and the information is being leaked, be it as David experienced or others on Skype or telesurgery or so on that we experienced. We have no doubt that this is the situation. We have three more minutes. Fabian, do you want to add to the telemedicine security? Yeah. Um, okay. So first thing I, I would say that I did uh, implement uh, processes and policies that are uh, designed to uh, uh, implement proper privacy and security. Uh, work with service providers or companies that are known to uh, be strong in terms of security and privacy. In telemedicine, security and privacy is a key, a key, key feature, period. Uh, uh, not use solutions. I understand that in emergency, you may want to go for solutions that are not that safe, but there is a point in time where uh, the organization has to be equipped with solutions that provide uh, say, uh, privacy and security environment uh, dedicated to telemedicine. So these are our, our recommendations, including end-to-end -end encryption. In Pakistan, the solution is fully secured, is only dedicated to telemedicine. It's a small database, so there is little interest for people to, uh, to hack it. Uh, uh, you lock uh, uh, your uh, expert into an environment that they can only them can access. Uh, I know we can use a WhatsApp. WhatsApp is widely used at MSF uh, uh, until we're going to have a, a problem because we're using WhatsApp. But it addresses a specific needs. Uh, I'm not here to uh, create a challenge. Uh, Any one more final question before we have Fabian and Safa answer? Let's just get, let's get the question. Yeah, Mitch Phillips from uh, um, MSF. So I have a question for Gassan. Because it's, it goes wider than the electronic advantages of the data collection. It's really about how, um, because in, in general, I think the HIMS is great to report on volume, activity volumes, but not much analysis is done. So how, in, how do you see the fact that data are sent through even more rapidly, more effectively, away from the health facilities? Uh, is that not discouraging also the health facility managers, the health providers to l analyze and interpret the data for, man for better management? So we have one minute for Hassan, and so half a minute for you, Hassan, and a minute for Pierre and Sapa. Uh, so th thank you for that. Actually, this is one of the m was and still one of uh, the most interesting collaborative work. Uh, when we started the data collection within the first month, we created a, a, an account for the hospital management team, uh, like a guest account to see their own data. And once they start to see their activity, they were so happy to follow. And they were making sure that their staff is doing proper data entry because it was the first time for them to be able to, to watch in a, in, in, in a very clear way, what they are doing in their facility, what's going wrong, what's going right. And they start to use those findings to improve the quality of their work. Just quickly here, uh, regarding the use of data in MSF, 
so people think that okay, to follow activity is, is, is very important, but actually this project allows us to, to follow the quality of care. So I can tell you in, in a given project, a maternity project, the number of patients who had postpartum infection, number of patients who had episiotomy in your facility. But in our data, we give you those information, but we'll also tell you what is the percentage of postpartum infections that occurred after the episiotomy in our facility. So if it was high, you, you need to f deal with your, with your midwives to improve the quality of care they're providing to, to, to prevent this type of uh, postpartum infections. Basically, we have details, very low level details, uh, very disaggregated data on very granular level that we start to use for operative purposes, operation purposes. So we have 30 seconds for stuff over here, and then we'll Sure, I will, I will try to go as, as quick as possible. Um, so uh, you, you were talking about aesthetic and functional. I, I prefer to talk about passive and uh, mechanical uh, prosthesis, uh, because the, everything is um, about what we call about functional. For me, a passive prosthesis can be more functional than any active prosthesis that you can see on one of our cases. So if you have an, an aesthetic um, prosthetic, which is passive or and, and allow the person to uh, have less social stigmatization and go back outside and go back to the market, for example, it's functional. If you have a, a specific tool that allow this person to uh, hit like the, the one we see before, it's functional, but it's passive. So it's simple and it's also giving uh, sometimes a, a more, accept, more acceptance. So yes, the, those choices were driven by the, uh, by the patient, but thank you for this question, it's a very important one. Well, thank you, everybody. This was a very uh, informative uh, session.